So Dr. Wiseman, you've written a book. Yes. Tell me a bit about this book. What's the title? Uh, it's called A Surgeon's Journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a bunch of vignettes that, little stories that I have wrote down, recorded events that happened uh, starting way back when I was young, uh, sort of following my path into becoming a surgeon. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've read the book and I was very impressed by the message, which really seems to talk about humanism and empathy in medicine. Is that something that you see that you think is missing in medicine today? Uh, I think that, yeah, there is kind of a, um, maybe not a lack of empathy, but a lack of understanding of empathy in medicine that's become more acute, mm -hmm. you know, as medicine has evolved, as things become busier, you know, we're, we're more under more pressure to see more patients, financial concerns and things like that. It leaves less time for empathy, I think. Mm -hmm. What effect has that had on, you know, patient care? What do you think? I mean, it's been pretty well documented in the literature that physicians who show empathy, and you can measure this, you know, by a test, there's, there's models and tools you can use to measure empathy, uh, that physicians that are more empathetic have better outcomes. Their patients have better outcomes. They're more compliant. They're less likely to have complications. They're more satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, they're more likely to come back and see that physician. It is a, 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 you know, a wonder. It is something that is a tool that physicians can use to help their patients. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's kind of ironic here, coming from a surgeon, <clears throat> myself, a family physician, who's really this typically stereotypically we don't think of surgeons necessarily as always the most empathetic. But now, now you're a, a professor here mm -hmm. at Lake Hummel Elmira, and you teach students. What what is it that we do here? In, in the PBL, problem-based learning format, to help teach empathy? Well, we have, a, a, uh, I think, a, a wonderful opportunity because the PBL curriculum is basically individual patient cases. Mm -hmm. So you, within those cases, there's always an opportunity, most of the cases, um, to look and say, what's the, the psychosocial aspect of it? Where would, if we define empathy, however we define it, where would that come into play and maybe help with the patient outcomes? Mm -hmm. So I think um, we can, we have that opportunity over two years, mm -hmm. so we can kind of reinforce it. I think that's important. Obviously, you teach something once, it goes away. You continue to teach it, then you're going to reinforce it um, and bring it more to, to, to students' minds, that this is part of what I need to do to take care of that patient. Mm -hmm. Now, what difference do you see that making, though, ultimately? in the student. Obviously they spend the first two years here, but then they're out in clinical rotations in this environment that's uh, somewhat toxic sometimes. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very good point. I think if you, when we track empathy across the medical students, the big drop off is between the second and third years when they go into the clinical rotations and they're suddenly uh, confronted with real life situations, which can be obviously more stressful in the classroom. Um, Certainly there's an opportunity to continue this into the third year, like sort of reinforcing doses. But, um, you know, our intention would be that if we build enough of it in, if it becomes much more automatic, it's less likely to wear off as they get into that, their clinical rotations. Mm -hmm. Is teaching empathy in, in medical school something that's now being done in most schools? Is this something more unique to LECOM? Um, What's your understanding it's, of that? It's not, you know, there, the, there is a, a dearth of empathy education in medical education. Um, it's usually, a, if it is being taught, usually it's a lecture, it's something like this. There's no sort of standard way it's done. Some people do watch movies, some people do uh, standardized patients, some people do role playing, things like that. Um, there's not a whole lot of, let's say, formalized, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's a very subjective thing anyway to begin with, um, but I think uh, there's a lot of room to be able to incorporate this in a much more, I don't want to say standardized, but more formal way so that you can carry it through. Um, and you're not really teaching it so much as you are making people aware of the empathy that they have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think most people are born with empathy. You can measure the neural circuits in the brain when somebody's being empathetic. Um, and most people have it. It's make sure they realize that it's there and then realize the benefit, not only to the patient, but to themselves. 
uh, physicians, it's been shown that are more empathetic and more caring and compassionate have less burnout. Mm -hmm. So it's not only just for your patient, it's for, it's for you. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a win-win. You know, it, it's an e it's, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't cost anything. Right. You're not ordering a test, you're not doing this, you're just merely taking some extra time or actions or whatever, um, and it benefits the patient. Now, why is it that some studies are, not, are showing that students, in fact, from year one of medical <clears throat> school to year four, and then through residency, become less empathetic? What is it about that continuum of training when they hit the clinical years that's uh, making students be perceived as less empathetic? What is it? I think that um, obviously you can only prepare so much in the first two years for the reality of clinical medicine. And you go out there and you um, encounter some very difficult situations. What do I do? You know, it's somewhat overwhelming. You take a relatively, you know, someone in their 20s, maybe they don't have a, a significant life experience, they haven't been through those sorts of things. They see death, they see suffering, they see a child die or something like that. How do I deal with it? They look to their mentors. And um, the mentors look to, look to their mentors. And there was actually some, oh, this was maybe 50 or 60 years ago, maybe even longer, there was a feeling that you needed to be somewhat detached to be a good physician. Um, and even that was the idea of the first day showing people cadavers, that you were going to desensitize a little bit. And it is a reasonable protective mechanism. You know, mm -hmm. it is very stressful. It's very, you don't want to be completely overwhelmed and, and become, you know, a puddle uh, of, of tears when you need to see another patient and another patient. So um, a lot of times it's just been a not very necessarily insightful way to deal with these situations that's just been passed down. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the idea. If we've shown them another way and mm -hmm. we've reinforced it, they can look and say, gee, I was taught to deal with it this way. Now I'm being taught to do it this way. This might be the better way. This is the, mm -hmm. this is the path that I want to take. The book has a, a number of very impactful passages, <clears throat> chapters. But what made you more empathetic? What changed you as a physician to have this level of introspection and be more empathetic with patients? What was it? Well, unfortunately, you know, it usually takes something uh, significant like that. And that was the loss of my son. And this occurred when my wife and I were both residents. We were in the hospital that we were training in. And, um, you know, the, when he passed, not... I don't, there was, I don't remember any attending ever saying anything, ever giving any sort of condolences or anything else. Uh, it was only an orderly, uh, a fellow who was one of those people that was always there to help you out. You know, when you're in the emergency room, you needed a hand. He knew where to find whatever piece of equipment you needed. He was just one of those Johnny on the spots. And he was the only one that really came in and had sort of that genuine feeling of, uh, of emotion and empathy. And that's what I remember, you know. Um, and you can understand that this was a terrible thing and that people felt like um, it was painful for them to watch somebody they knew lose a child. Everybody, in the, most of my attendings obviously were older and had children and they could relate to that pain. Um, and then there was the idea, well, we don't want to bring it up and we don't want to mention it, you know. We don't want to re-stir up those feelings. And you were trying to say, those feelings are always there. They never go away. Um, so it was just sort of, um, you know, again, I don't blame anyone. It's not anyone's fault. No one is intending to be that way. It's just a lack of understanding and a lack of insight and a lack of, you know, really appreciation of how important that empathy would be. Because obviously it left an impact on me and my wife. We mm -hmm. look back and, you know, at how we were treated. And in some ways it's like, okay, this wasn't a good thing. Um, so we'll do our best to kind of maybe change that narrative a little bit. And the feedback we got from patients when we went to um, different support groups was even more so. You know, the physicians really at that moment, um, when someone lost a child, lost a loved one, their sort of lack of empathy, per perceived lack of empathy by the patients was tremendous. Uh, yeah. They really we really don't do a good job as a profession in that situation. So 
part of this is to sort of correct that, if you will. Mm -hmm. Maybe make a difference, make, make physicians, physicians in training understand that this is very important. This is a uh, life-changing event for the patients um, and that your words have power. You're in a position of authority, in a position of, you know, of knowledge and intelligence and patients are looking to you for some help. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be anything profound. It just has to be an awareness of what the situation is and how important your actions and words are to help maybe start that person down that healing. What were some tangible things that you did in your practice post this event <clears throat> to convey more empathy? What, obviously, you changed the way you interacted with patients. And, well, give me some examples. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it can be something as simple as when you walk into the room, you know, you smile. Where do you sit? You know, um, sitting even with the patient. Um, asking people, you know, I always like to look at where people were from, if they, were, they lived close to where I live, or something like that, or they had something in common, or um, if you talk to them a little bit, find out if they had hobbies or something like that. That's what I always miss about the, I miss about the uh, old charts, or in the paper charts, you could write things in the margin about people, and, and there was a little note there, this guy likes to fish, or this woman likes to you know, quilt, or something like that, and you could start a little conversation, 30 seconds, a minute. And then that, that patient looks and says, oh, this person cares about me. Because they went a little bit extra just to find out about me. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think those things were important. Mm -hmm. um, also, even though, you know, you're, I don't know, sometimes I think some people are just better with their mannerisms, or they don't recognize that sometimes the way their, you know, their, their body positions, all that nonverbal communication, how much that can turn patients off. You know, for, you know, I, I, again, I teach the students, if you're going to talk to somebody, you should be, you know, you should be even. That makes, puts the patient at ease. If you're standing up and they're sitting down, there's a, there's, there, that can be intimidating, especially they don't know you. You know, they have this, you're the doctor, you're in that white coat, oh my goodness. You know, that sort of thing. Those things, they're little things. Right. You know, right up to the point when I would have to go out and tell someone, you know, as a surgeon, you know, somebody comes in, trauma, something like that, go out and tell them that their loved one has died, um, you know, maybe relate some of my story and, uh, and give people that idea that, wow, this, this person, they're just like me. They understand. Mm -hmm. They have some sort of insight. And it, it, I think it helps people. So what challenges does this era of <clears throat> artificial intelligence, <clears throat> uh, technology, telemedicine, where they always seem to want to do a telemedicine, is it harder to convey empathy, given the environment we're now practicing? I think so. I mean, it definitely is, because there, I think it's the, you know, we can go on and on about phone, I, you know, cell phones and things like that. But um, if 80% of communication is nonverbal, you take so much of that away when you're doing that mm -hmm. virtual or texting or whatever else like that. You can't get the, you can't get the impression, is that person listening to me? What's their facial expressions? All those things are reassuring. I mean, we evolved for thousands and thousands of years to take on those nonverbal clues. Mm -hmm. We recognize them. Mm -hmm. We may not necessarily cognitively recognize them, but we're responding to them. Somebody gets too close to you, you back away, all those sorts of things. That's all part of being human and human communication. We've taken that out in a lot of ways with some of these um, virtual visits and texting and you know, all these sorts of things. And um, you know, one of the things I always, this is one of the little things that I did when I was uh, um, uh, attending, is when I would go to see my patients before surgery, they'd be in the waiting room, they'd be hooked up to the monitor, and I'd watch their pulse. And I'd go talk to them and say, how you doing, have them sign the consent, we're all set, you know, give them a little bit, their pulse would come down. Okay. So to me, it was, there was that recognition that that person's there, you know, mm -hmm. in the flesh, there to take care of me. Mm -hmm. Their anxiety went down. And we know that if their anxiety is less, they're going to do better with surgery. So it's very, and then you combine that with, you know, the we have to see more patients and money's tight and all those sorts of things. We've really kind of gotten away from the original purpose of medicine. And that's mm -hmm. to take care of people. Right. We're focusing on treating. We, we need to refocus again on taking care of people. Because you know, we can't always treat people. 
but we can always take care of them. And that's our, that should be our first and foremost thing. Now you've practiced over 30 years. You're a seasoned educator being involved in graduate medical education, medical students, and teaching uh, MD, allopathic students, mm -hmm. and DO students. Is there anything uniquely about osteopathic medical students that uh, would make them more humanistically, innately, by the application process or such? Have you seen that uh, in your experience? Um, yes, to a certain degree, and, 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 and actually the literature backs it up. If you measure empathy, osteopathic students tend to have more empathy than MD students. Um, I don't think it's the degree per se. Okay. It tends to be uh, uh, osteopathic physicians tend to go into more family practice, more people-oriented things, and those specialties have more empathy. And they need more empathy, so it's kind of a natural fit. So, um, you know, certainly it's a, a very intriguing idea that the, the osteopathic philosophy instilled in them would maybe give them empathy. That's right. a, that's an interesting idea. Certainly makes sense. Mm -hmm. Certainly makes sense. What about LECOM and the unique problem-based learning curriculum that you know very few schools fully embrace in the mm -hmm. model that we do? What about basically 90% of our curriculum at several of our campuses is purely problem-based learning. What about that, as far as we, we briefly touch on that? What, what can we do to attract students to, to convey empathy and humanism within that uh, curriculum? Yeah, I think it goes back to looking at the cases and building into that those cases, the part of that discussion of those cases in the curriculum is a dedicated chunk of time. Okay. or whatever time, whatever process, that you look at those things and mm -hmm. say, first, you know, define empathy, to teach the students a little about what they're supposed to be looking for, and then you can go to that case and mm -hmm. say, gee, what, what, what do you think this patient's feeling? Right. What do you think their concerns are? Because obviously, you know, most of the time we look at what our concerns are. I need to get a blood test. I need mm -hmm. to get this. Well, this person's worried about, you know, how am I going to pay for it? And, you know, what's going to happen? Will my wife be able to take care of me? All those sorts of things. That's part of the process that we can teach. And I, what I really think is uh, a wonderful opportunity is to be able to do it over time. Mm -hmm. I think the more we do it, the more durable, mm -hmm. you know, the response will be. Right. Does that... Uh uh, educational platform, the, the problem-based learning curriculum, lend itself more to the ability to perhaps engage these kind of humanistic qualities in a physician? I'm, I'm asking your opinion about that. I think so because within there you have a certain amount of flexibility. Okay. Um, you know, you can have someone play the patient. You, you know, it's more of a small group discussion and you can really bring those feelings out. Uh, you know, I've done it very, in my groups, a lot of times when we have PBO cases where the patient dies mm -hmm. and really start to really get the students to really tell me what they're feeling and get them to react. Because right. a lot of times they react like, well, I needed to do this, I need to do that. It's like, no, no, how are you feeling right now? Right. You know, and bring that up and say, gee, now how do you think that patient's feeling? Right. And that allows them to sort of connect a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And in that small group um, environment, it's it's harder for that student to get away from my questions. Right. You know what I mean? So you have the opportunity to really call somebody out and say, how are you feeling? What do you, how does this make you feel? Right. Does it make you feel mad? Does it make you feel sad? Does it make you feel angry? And then how is that going to affect your response to the patient? Because it's only natural. The patient doesn't follow your orders, patient's non-compliant, that you're going to be angry at that patient. Mm -hmm. And then if that patient has a bad outcome, how are, is that going to interfere with your ability to be empathetic to that patient? Gotcha. So you need to recognize those feelings because they're there mm -hmm. and you don't want them to necessarily interfere with your ability to carry forth the care on that patient. So let's switch gears. You've actually worked, you've worked quite a bit in the clinical setting with residents and with students. Mm -hmm. What can medical students do in the clinical setting to convey empathy when they're having their interviewing patients or what, what tangibly can, the, can they do? The students are in kind of a unique opportunity because they're not under the clock the way we are. Mm -hmm. So they have the opportunity to take a little extra time because most of the time the residents and the attendings will say, go take your time, and they realize you're going to take longer. One of the easiest things is to become comfortable and act natural. You know, that's, I, I, you know, I think that we, sometimes we stress too much on algorithms and asking patients questions. 
I think we need to teach residents, certainly there's a, or students, there certainly is an idea these are the questions you need to ask, but they need to, the questions need to flow, you need to be more natural, you need to be more relaxed. And that, that takes time. So some of it does take time, getting the students in there, getting them relaxed. But also teaching them that, that, that this isn't just a patient sitting, this is another human being. So taking that time maybe to ask a few questions about what, you know, what's going on or what are your concerns are beyond this. I mean, what are you really worried about, sir? You know, I'm really worried that I'm not going to be able to get a ride to get my radiation treatment. Oh, hmm. wow, that's a, I, can, I can take care of that for you, sir. We'll get a social worker, whatever. Where the person may not necessarily bring that up unless you ask. Mm -hmm. So teaching the students to try to probe that patient, try to develop a little bit of a relationship, understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Use their cognitive empathy to try to figure out what is this patient feeling right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to look and say we have to solve the problem. Okay, and it is, yes, that's true. But also part of that, but part of fixing that problem is getting the patient on board mm -hmm. and connecting to the patient and their feelings, so that they're going to be more compliant. They're going to end up doing better. So you mentioned uh, about studies have demonstrated that more empathy seems to lead to better outcomes. Yes and less physician uh, burnout. Can you elaborate on that? Tell me um, yeah, there's a bunch of different studies. Some of them, I think, were with diabetic patients. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you can understand that's somebody you're going to have a long history with. Mm -hmm. And it did show that it increased their compliance, helped them with their outcomes. Uh, same thing with some uh, decreased their incidence of cardiovascular problems. Uh, because obviously, this is a, you're not a one-time visit as mm -hmm. a diabetic. You're going to be followed. So the idea was that, you know, the if you make that connection, the, the patient trusts you, and then you f you know if you can trust the patient because mm -hmm. you've sort of gotten into their skin a little bit and understand, hey, this is somebody who's not necessarily compliant. Maybe I need to see him more frequently. Or this person's going to let me know if there's a problem, and then you can feel more comfortable. And all, also the patient knows if I make a call, I'm going to get a response. If mm -hmm. I have a question, I'm going to get a response because my doctor cares. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be much more likely to be compliant. Let's just double click on that a little bit. This idea of trust with patients. Is it lacking today? I think it's hard to establish that in a five minute visit. Okay. It's hard to, um, you know, physicians are hurried. Um, you know, there's a lot of bad press about the bad doctors, you know. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's something we, sh we should, as a profession, need to keep working on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we're always fighting against the internet. You know, you tell somebody something, well, I went on the internet last night mm -hmm. and I looked this up and doctor, that's not what I read. And, and you know, you're, how do you politely, but you know, firmly say, well, that's not your case. This is based on my experience, my opinion. So that can be you know, a big friction when it comes to developing trust. But again, if the, that, if that patient looks at you and says, this doctor cares about me, they're much more likely to follow your opinion than they are something on a screen. Mm -hmm. And that empathy, trust, we can teach that in medical school? I think we can teach it or reinforce it. You know, I, I think you either have it or you don't. You know, someone who is not very empathetic is going to be tough to be, become very empathetic. They will get to their level. I mean, every, some people are, can be very empathetic without saying a word. Mm -hmm you know, or it's, it's just their mannerisms or their, whatever it is. But it's to recognize that whatever they can do to display or convey, convene empathy, they do. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can't have everybody cry. Not everybody's a crier. Mm -hmm. Some people will, some people are very comfortable with that. It's natural, it's normal, patients will accept that. Uh, other people aren't. Maybe it's just a hug, maybe it's just a hand on the shoulder, a touch. That may be all it's needed. So it's the idea of, of whatever you can do, whatever empathy you have, keep it, reinforce it, understand its importance. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like be aware of it and maybe be insightful in how you're being perceived. Think about how your Absolutely. patient Absolutely. might be perceiving you. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a big thing is you can recognize those feelings, but then the question, you know, the, the need for that in your patient, but then it's also the second part is how do I act, react to that? Mm -hmm. You know, do how is what's the appropriate way to to, to act? Mm -hmm. You know, and there will you know, and there's times when you have to sort of limit 
you know, your, your empathy, you look, I can't right, really break down right now. I've got two other patients to see, but it's not inappropriate to call that person, that patient, later on mm -hmm. and say, hey, I was just following up, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, those sorts of things can make, make a huge difference. A letter, a note, something like that. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, the family says, wow, this doctor cared, you know. Makes a big difference. Makes a big difference, you know, even if you want to break it down to a, as base as a PR, you know, type of a thing. You know, you're going to, that patient's going to go out there and sing the praises of you and your institution because they felt like they were cared for. Now, probably 80% of physicians now, after finishing residency, are, are joining a large practice, typically working for a hospital system. Mm -hmm. Do they encourage this? Do they promote this among their uh, physicians that they hire? Is it something that, that's valued for, um, by, by the larger hospital systems? The short answer is no, um, uh, but it should be. Okay. Because, you know, if, and I, it would be an interesting study to actually crank the numbers, but mm -hmm. I guarantee you it would be cost effective. Okay. That if, you know, Allowing people, you know, using that empathy to increase compliance and decrease complications and decrease all those sorts of things doesn't cost you anything. You're not earning a test. You're, yes, you're taking more time maybe in the office. Okay. I'm sure there, and there's, you know, some bean counter can look at that. But in the long run, it's probably cost effective. And if you're, less physicians are burning out, you're not hiring more physicians, um, you know, you're getting increased efficiency out of your physicians. They're happier. Mm -hmm. They're going to see more patients. You know, all those sorts of things. It's, it, it, to me, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about you have to get everybody, you know, super sappy and all and sing kumbaya. It's just simple things that I think we all know how to do. Most of us know how to do. Some of us are not empathetic. But we know how to do. It's recognizing that they're effective and that, you know, they're appropriate. And you know, maybe it doesn't fit in the paradigm that we've been taught for over the generations, but it's appropriate to do. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And it sounds like we can teach that, mm -hmm. we can measure that, Yes. and then we can, you know, see what difference it actually makes with our patients. Yes, with that, outcomes. yes absolutely. And then also you touched on just self-preservation and mm -hmm. just this idea of burnout mm -hmm. with physicians. Why, why is that at unprecedented levels today, in, in your opinion? Oh, there's a lot of things. I mean, one is the electronic medical record. We hope we can go there. Okay. Um, I, th I think that um, the electronic medical record is kind of the straw to mm -hmm. break the camel's back. Okay. I, think, I think most people enjoy, most physicians enjoy a patient you can interact with. Okay. You know, you enjoy that. You enjoy going in there, seeing a patient who respects you and listens to you, and you can help them. That's a rewarding. That's why we went into this profession. You, that's been whittled away okay. because you have to see more patients. Um, you don't have time. You know now there's all these specialists. You know you're seeing somebody one cardiologist one time and get set up for cardiac cath. You're seeing an orth orthopod, boom, you get to have surgery, all those sorts of things. So there's less time to have that long longitudinal re uh, relationship with patients where you really, you enjoy seeing them. You look and say, oh, I'm going to see Mr. So-and-so. I enjoy, he's a, he's a character. I enjoy, mm -hmm. I'm going to spend my, I enjoy spending my time with him. That's been sort of whittled away. So that innate satisfaction that we have of seeing patients and taking care of them has been slowly whittled away. Um, and it's, and that extra time, well, where do you cut, where do you trim that off? Some of that is the empathy, some is that extra time. Some of it is also your own self-defense. Um, you know, if you absorb a lot of the suffering and pain of your patients, even if you absorb a fraction, eventually it's going to build up inside of you. And if you don't realize how to deal with it, mm -hmm. it's going to bring you down. You know, and I think that, you know, is also part of it, not teaching ourselves as physicians, it's appropriate to feel these emotions. Here's how to deal with them. It's like any emotion. If you're angry and you don't get it out, you don't deal with it, it eventually consumes you. Mm -hmm. If you are sad or you're, you're feeling these, you know, um, this suffering of your patients or whatever that, that feeling is, if you don't deal with it, it's going to build up, it's going to cause a problem. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in the EMR on top of that, 
And that's why a lot of physicians in our generation just said, that's it. It sounds like need to do this part of this foundationally, Dr. Wiseman, is empathy to self as well. Absolutely. Caring about yourself. Absolutely. You need to care about yourself so you can better care about yeah. others. So yes, so. and there's a little glimmer of hope in this new generation. Um, you know, our generation, we, were, we sacrificed everything, you know. We, we worked 100 hours a week. I mean, you know, and that was, you got it off easy that week. This generation is a little bit better at saying, hmm, I want to draw the line and I, I have a little bit more outside interests and things like that. So maybe it's a good, it might be a good time to sort of reintroduce this idea to them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that'll have some benefit for them down the road. Because, I mean, we can't, doctors now have the highest suicide rates. All this is all tied together. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't keep going down the same way. We're just going to keep burning out physicians. Good people, people went into this profession, which is a noble, wonderful profession for all the right reasons, and then they get chewed up and spit out. It's not good. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to do what we can to try to change that. So the take-home message for potential students that might be considering applying to medical school, specifically to Lee Cobb, is what regarding is, empathy if you're going to come here we're going to teach you the whole spectrum of how to be a good doctor whether you know the, the knowledge the techniques and then all those other non clinical non sort of all those other things that make a big difference such as empathy such as empathy thank you